Have you ever really wanted to play a console exclusive game, but didn't want to have to purchase a brand new console just to play it? Every console has had at least a few great exclusives, but collecting every console would become very costly. For instance, let's say that you purchased a brand new copy of Bubsy 3D because the game review by PS Extreme stated it's beautiful graphics, great tunes, solid gameplay, unique style, a little puzzle solving, and surprisingly deep, thoughtful gameplay add up to an experience that no action platform gamer should miss. As there was no internet to verify if the claim was actually correct, you excitedly wait to play it, but you don't have the money to buy a brand new system because you already purchased a Sega Genesis, Sega CD expansion, and 32X expansion. What if Sega designed yet another expansion as the Genesis still had plenty of room to spare and allowed the Genesis to play PlayStation games? Now you could sit back and enjoy the lauded game and only have to pay a fraction of the price of what a new console would cost as Sega would competitively have priced the new add-on. Sound impossible? Perhaps under today's laws it would be, but the ColecoVision did just that, and even called it out directly in its advertising. It's Atari's video game, Defender. I played on ColecoVision. Activision. I played on ColecoVision. Mattel's M Network and Imagine. We, we played, played them on ColecoVision. ColecoVision. Introducing ColecoVision's first expansion module that lets you play all Atari 2600 compatible cartridges. And with all of ColecoVision's cartridges, that means you can play more games than any other video game system. It's simple. You can play Atari 2600 cartridges on ColecoVision, but you can't play ColecoVision on Atari. ColecoVision, the expandable video game home computer system. So, did the lawsuit by Atari shut down the ColecoVision and send it to the video game system graveyard? Or would ColecoVision do as they wish with no repercussions? Let's start at the beginning of the ColecoVision's life cycle and see how it all played out. of your destiny for as long as you can keep the trip going. This is the Arcade Experience. We're ColecoVision. We bring the Arcade Experience home with games like Donkey Kong with multiple screens, Arcade Controls, and Arcade Graphics that let you have the Arcade Experience at home because your vision is our vision. ColecoVision. First off, let's take a look at what came inside the ColecoVision box itself. Obviously, we've got the console, a pair of controllers, an RF switch before the day of all these fancy HDMI cables, Donkey Kong game and instructions, and a massive power block. Though the Atari 2600 was the main competitor for the ColecoVision, it actually came out in 1977, five years before the ColecoVision, and was priced at $175. When the ColecoVision actually released to the market, it was $199 as opposed to the reduced price for the 2600 of $125. Now, when you look at the price that the ColecoVision would be in 2019 standards at $835, that kind of puts things into perspective a little bit when you think back to the people that were pretty mad about the PlayStation 3 being a whopping $599 in 2006. So as far as the price portion, the ColecoVision was behind a little bit when it came to the Atari 2600. Now you might be asking where the Atari 5200 came into play with all of this, and we can look at that real quick here. While the Atari 5200 came out in November of 1982 as well, most people still remember and refer to the Atari 2600 in conversations. The 5200 was sold as a system that would produce better graphics than the Atari 2600 and the Intellivision, but did not feature backwards compatibility with the extensive Atari 2600 library that already enthralled customers. 
Atari did create the 5200 to compete with the ColecoVision and decided to focus on a certain aspect of the ColecoVision in the advertising. If you think ColecoVision plays all Atari cartridges... You mean it can't? Here's Pac-Man on ColecoVision. But here's Pac-Man for the Atari 5200 Super System. Now you're talking. And it doesn't work on ColecoVision. But won't their adapter? It won't play Super System cartridges. Not pole position? Not this pole position. Not centipede? Not this centipede. Only on the Atari 5200 Super System. But aren't they hard to find? They're everywhere. Everywhere? The Atari 5200 Super System. So, the advertising strategy used by Atari was interesting as they actually point out that the ColecoVision can play Atari 2600 games, but they try to build a case on the ColecoVision's inability to play Atari 5200 games. As the Atari 2600 had been released five years prior, it was much more attractive to buyers to be able to play the aggregated library of Atari 2600 games and Atari's claims of not being able to play 5200 games would only be valid if 5200 games were far superior to ColecoVision's. So, let's take a quick look at Pac-Man as it was referenced in the ad. Alright, so here's Pac-Man. On the left, you've got the arcade version, nice and vibrant. On the right is the actual ColecoVision version of Pac-Man. Now that's what you would be playing if you purchased the ColecoVision version. Here's the Atari 2600 version. So, as you remember from the commercial, it was called out that this was Atari 2600 on the ColecoVision. So yes, it was, but it was the Atari 2600 version played with the adapter. Here we have the Atari 5200 version. As you can see, it's uh, nice and vibrant as well. Does look a good amount like the arcade version, but when compared to the ColecoVision version, it's not that much of a difference. And, some might even say that the ColecoVision version is even more vibrant. From the comparison, the Atari 5200 Pac-Man was not marginally superior to the ColecoVision's game. So, the marketing strategy on attacking the ColecoVision for not being able to play 5200 games was pretty silly, as the consumers were not that interested in playing 5200 games on it in the first place. On the flip side, Coleco had their own commercials pointing out its ability to play the coveted 2600 games. While Atari keeps trying to sell you new systems, like the 5200, with ColecoVision you only need one system, because ColecoVision expands to give you a Super Action controller set with Super Action Baseball, a driving module with Turbo, an expansion module to play all Atari 2600 games, and only ColecoVision plugs into the Atom module to become the complete Atom computer system. So if you don't want to keep buying new systems, there's only one system to buy, ColecoVision. Sorry, Atari. So, oddly enough, the Atari 5200 was initially not able to play 2600 games, but Atari's competitors, such as ColecoVision, offered an adapter to play these popular games. Atari did try to sue Coleco because of a claimed breach of their 2600 patent, but the downside for Atari was that at the time, video games were relatively still in their infancy, and thus there were no laws in place that protected ownership rights. Since Coleco proved that it used off-the-shelf parts to build the emulator, the courts did not agree with Atari that Coleco violated the patent. After the ruling, Coleco continued to crank out games and even create its own Atari 2600 clone called the Coleco Gemini. So now it's time to see if the ColecoVision lived up to its claim of being the arcade quality video game system. So we're going to start out with one of the classics, Donkey Kong. As you see on the left, you got the arcade version, the original, and the right is ColecoVision. Uh, ColecoVision is one of the most comprehensive versions of Donkey Kong as far as the stages itself. Um, but, uh, of course, the arcade version, you know, the colors pop a little bit more, and it has the additional levels, uh, as does the NES version. The NES version did come out later on, since the NES was not released uh, until a few years later. But, uh, not too shabby for the ColecoVision version, I'd say there. Next we have Zaxxon. It's a 2.5D 
shooter, you got the arcade on the left. ColecoVision does a decent um, job as far as doing the 2.5D, but the graphics aren't exactly arcade quality. But when compared to the Atari 2600 version, you can see it is quite a difference. Centipede, another classic, got the arcade on the left, and ColecoVision on the right. Uh, ColecoVision is, does a pretty good job of looking like the arcade version. And there's ColecoVision compared to the Atari 2600 Centipede. Uh, quite a difference. The Centipede itself um, uh, has a lot more definition in the ColecoVision version. Uh, the Atari 2600 did come out a little bit before the ColecoVision. Next up is Gorf, the arcade version on the left there. Bright blue back of the screen as far as the background. It's pretty interesting to me because um, it, it is so bright, whereas the ColecoVision is actually uh, more pleasing on the eyes as far as the way that uh, I would see it. The Atari 2600 versus the ColecoVision, um, they look kind of similar. The ships themselves look very different. Burger Time, this is something that I had played on the NES uh, quite a bit when I was younger. Uh, you can see the arcade versus the ColecoVision. Arcade uh, is very defined. ColecoVision doesn't do a too bad job, uh, but whenever you compare it with the Atari 2600, you can tell that there is quite a difference. And there's the NES version I threw in there just because uh, it does have some nostalgia for me. Um, it holds up pretty well as far as the ColecoVision since the ColecoVision comes out a few years before the NES version. Alright, and Frogger. Um, as far as the arcade and the ColecoVision version, it's a pretty good rendition. The Atari 2600 version tries to hold its own against the ColecoVision. Um, the, the graphics themselves aren't as defined, the colors aren't as defined, but it's not too bad. For Spy Hunter, the arcade version, uh, very defined graphics. ColecoVision does a pretty decent job. Uh, it is a smaller screen uh, as opposed to the arcade version. The Atari 2600, no, not too bad. Um, it does pretty well compared to a lot of the Atari 2600 games. Um, but ColecoVision, of course, still holds its own. And there's the NES that comes out a couple years later. Next up is Galaxian. Uh, the arcade version is beautiful on the left there, even the background with the stars uh, twinkling, very defined. ColecoVision does a decent job of trying to keep up with it. A smaller screen, of course, uh, it's more compact. Atari 2600 versus the ColecoVision, the Atari 2600 doesn't have all the twinkling stars in the background, um, but not too shabby. Cubert, one of the classics. Um, the arcade versus the ColecoVision. It looks pretty similar. The Atari 2600, the Atari 2600 holds its own. Uh, it's not as defined. Um, a little bit more crude as far as the graphics, but it does enough to get the job done. And there's the NES version that comes out a couple years later. And one of the arcade classics, Pie Pie. As you can see on the left, it's very defined, very clean and clear. ColecoVision does an okay job, but like you can see, Pie Pie uh, is just uh, almost totally white with a few black specks. Um, the Atari 2600, I can barely tell which one Pie Pie is. Uh, <laughs> the NES version does a very good job, so I have to say on this one, the NES version. Uh, is the superior one. It does come out a couple years after the ColecoVision version, but it still is a beautiful version. And let's go ahead and compare one final game. Let's make it Tapper. Uh, many people remember Tapper as the bartender that spoke to Wreck-It Ralph when Ralph was coming to terms with being labeled as a bad guy and was in search of a medal. As we see here, we have the arcade version on the left and the Coleco version on the right. The arcade version has very clear... Wait, what?! 
Hold on a second. Hold on. All right, so a little bit of history within this history. Tapper was originally sponsored in 1983 by Anheuser-Busch, which is the producer of Budweiser beer. The plan was to sell the game to bars and included drink holders and footrests. Machines even had actual Budweiser beer tap handles to give the authentic bartender experience. It was rethemed in 1984 as Root Beer Tapper for distribution to arcades and then later to consoles. The retheme removed the chance of a child playing the game in an arcade in which he was serving beer with beer taps, as that could be viewed as the game advertising alcohol to minors. The gameplay remained the same throughout the retheming, and many home versions had a Pepsi or Mountain Dew sign. From the comparisons, it appears that ColecoVision was accomplishing its goal of bringing an arcade experience to the home. If nothing else, at least from a graphic standpoint, as playing games with a cell phone like controller does not seem that intuitive. While Coleco found success with its first ColecoVision expansion that allowed consumers to play Atari 2600 games, the company's victory in expansion modules would not be seen again, and further expansions would start the company's decline. The second module was a steering wheel, complete with gas pedal and the game Turbo. It was advanced for its time, but there ended up being not very many compatible games for it. Nevertheless, that did not stop Coleco from creating high-octane commercials promoting their new product. The new game. Hi. We got it! Great, and I'm driving! It's ColecoVision's new driving module with Sega's Turbo, the video cartridge that looks and plays just like the arcade game. Changing roads. Through tunnels, oil slick, <laughs> race turbo on your ColecoVision, Atari VCS, or Intellivision game systems. The ColecoVision did have other types of controllers that attempted to bring gamers closer to the action. And while not considered an expansion module, there is one that is worthy of a callout just because of how many different features they try to jam into one controller. So move over, PlayStation DualShock controller, with your touchscreen and feedback. Super Ash controller comes with an arcade quality joystick, a speed roller, 12 button keypad, and player select triggers, all with a custom design grip and packaged with Super Action Baseball. It was only compatible with a handful of other games, but there was Rocky, Frontline, and Super Action Football. Introducing the ColecoVision Super Action Controller Set. With it, your vision expands. Now play all ColecoVision games and new Super Action Baseball, boxing, or football. Plot strategies in advance, offense, or defense. It's the first controller to move four individual players at once. And you get Super Action Baseball with multi-screens as a bonus. Expand your vision with the Super Action Controller Set. Because your vision is our vision. ColecoVision. The ColecoVision also had a trackball peripheral called the Roller Controller. There's not much to say about it as it's pretty self-explanatory. It came packaged with Slither, which was a snake shooting game in the same style as Centipede. Indiana Jones would not approve. The big risk came with expansion module number three. Initially it was to be called the Super Game Module, which would use Discount Life wafers to store saves, stats, and high scores. When it was shown at the 1983 toy show, it was met with praise and a hefty helping of hype. It was so hyped that Coleco started working on a second Super Game module that would allow movies and games to be played on a disc that was similar to those played on a video disc player. That was a player that came out before Laserdiscs and DVDs. It would have been ahead of the curve if it had come to fruition. But Coleco delayed the Super Game module in June of 1983. Then they canceled the entire project two months later as they announced that the new expansion module number three would be the Atom Computer instead. You'll never finish by morning. No problem. Now, command the powers of Atom with professional keyboard, high-speed memory drive, and built-in word processor program, all in one package. Oops, you gotta start over. Relax, Atom. Move that paragraph. <laughs> Is that legal? And print. Adam, even a letter quality daisy wheel printer. You did it! Adam, 
my launch sequence. Is that legal? Command the powers of Adam and program your future. While home computers are commonplace in homes now, back in 1983, home computers were just establishing themselves in the market. At the time, the Commodore 64 was the home computer that many individuals had chosen, and it was taking its share of the video game market. While the Commodore 64 was a computer that could play games, the goal of the Atom computer was to be a game console that could also be a computer. This trend has continued over the years, and one of the most noted was the PS2, which was a game console first, but added the strong selling point of its ability to play DVDs as well. The Atom computer utilized some of the scrapped Super Game Module components. It included a digital data pack that it used as a storage system, an add-on keyboard, a printer called the SmartWriter Electronic Typewriter, system software, and a bundled game. Coleco had owned the console rights for Donkey Kong, but Nintendo was licensing the rights for the computer market to Atari, so the Atom computer would need to find itself another accompanying game. It was decided that Buck Rogers, Planet of Zoom, would be included as it was initially planned for the Super Game module. The plan was to sell the Atom home computer as both an expansion module for the ColecoVision and as a standalone device. However, both would ultimately fail. As with many advances in technology, bugs and hardware malfunctions can be commonplace. One of which that impacted the Atom computer was that there were many digital data packs that would break right away upon use and would cause a magnetic surge to be sent from the system upon boot that would damage and or erase any data storage cassettes near it. That, combined with the hefty price tag of $750, which would be about $1,900 today after inflation, would lead to a difficult sale. So, the goal of the Atom computer was to provide a game console that could also be a computer, but the $750 price tag was more expensive than purchasing a ColecoVision to play games and a Commodore 64 to act as a computer. Coupled with the video game crash of 1983, Coleco was hit hard and exited the video game market in 1984. A year later, one of their licensing partners would come over from Japan and enter the home video game console market, igniting video games once again in the home. But that's a story for another time. Coleco went back to focusing on their toy lines like the Cabbage Patch Kids. People's interest in the Cabbage Patch Kids started declining though, and the company began to sell off its assets in 1988. Sadly, the company was too far gone from the financial damage that the Atom computer caused. The company filed for bankruptcy in 1988, stating that they had over $540 million in debt. In 1989, Hasbro purchased the remaining product lines. Attempts have been made to revitalize the Coleco brand in the marketplace. In 2006, the Coleco Sonic was introduced. In 2015, there was an announcement that the Coleco Chameleon would be created. It was a cartridge-based system placed on Indiegogo, but it only raised 63,000 of its $1.95 million goal. And as such, it never came to fruition. While the ColecoVision was a modest commercial success in comparison with the 30 million Atari 2600s that were sold, it was an important piece of video game history. Coleco set out on a mission to provide gamers an arcade experience within the home, and pushed for technological advances that created gaming experiences that had not been accomplished at that time. So the next time you're playing an arcade quality game on your current gym system of choice, remember that it all started with one company that wanted to provide the best version of Donkey Kong without making you go to an arcade. Oh yeah. Wait, I got it. Thanks for watching Pop Culture History. See you next time.